All right, <clears throat> welcome back to Race, Place, and Inequality. Uh, this week, October 25th through the 27th, uh, we are going to be discussing uh, race, place, and movement, particularly Chocolate Cities and the warmth of other suns, talking a little bit about the Great Migration, which is something that we've talked about you know, before, so I don't have to go into too much detail about it. Um, but this is kind of a different way of approaching it and uh, using, well, actually, I like both of these texts, really. The one of other sons <clears throat> was a um, New York, well, yeah, was a New York bestseller. Uh, I definitely think one of the most important books um, uh, that has come out in the 21st century, but also, uh, probably the leading book on, on the Great Migration and on one of the more leading books on migration period. So incredible text. Um, Chocolate Cities is uh, an amazing text that just came out a couple years ago. And I also think, it, I don't think you can have a conversation about place uh, without talking about this, uh, this particular text. Um, and I probably would, no, is it? No, no, no. Yeah, because I specialize in blackness as your um as the um the textbook. But if I didn't have specialized in blackness, I would probably have chocolate cities uh as as um as a uh, as a textbook for this class. So very, very important text, and we're gonna read a little bit out of it today um for this lecture. So Look forward to it. I hope you uh, enjoy it. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is this uh, place-based research project is due November 8th. So I hope that you are preparing for that. Um, I hope that you are, hold on, sorry. <clears throat> so yes, I hope that you are preparing for your place-based research project, which is due November 8th. Um, I'll also give you, I think, some time either next week or the following week. I won't make the lectures as long so that you can have that time to complete it. Um, if you have any questions, as always, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, but it is coming up, so I hope that you are um, preparing well for it. Uh, let's see. So. Let's go ahead and go to dust tracks on the chocolate map. By the way, this lecture is going to call for, I have a couple different YouTube links and things to watch and listen to and things like that. This one, um, much more interactive. So it definitely fares better in person, but um, it's okay. It's something that we can do via a lecture and um, it does call for um, a little bit of, of some additional sources that I use to kind of drive the point home, um, which I think it makes it more fun. Sometimes it's okay to just go with the with the reading, and then sometimes I think it's kind of fun to bring in videos and um, blogs and songs and things like that to also make points as well. So with that being said, the first link that I want you to click on is this one, um, short clip, two minutes. And then we will talk about, uh, we'll go further into this. So why do you think the authors began this story of migration, uh, movement, and region with Zora Neale Hurston? Why, why, why Zora Neale Hurston? Um, what do you know? Zora Neale Hurston, do you know who she is um, or anything about her? Um, and some of you may, I know some of you may be coming from African-American studies. Some of you may be coming from anthropology. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston was an anthropologist herself. I wanna say she got her master's degree in anthropology. Um, very brilliant woman uh, known for her fictional works um that were often based on live the live realities of black people in the early part of the 20th century um 
again, a very, very uh, brilliant woman um, and a person who really enjoyed exploring and examining the human experience, which is something that anthropologists um, do. Uh, in some ways it overlaps with sociology and in some ways it's different. Um, Zora Neale Hurston was born, well, they just told you in the, in the link, uh, born and raised in Eatonville, Florida. So actually not too far from um, where we are, Jacksonville, um, not too, maybe I think right outside of Orlando. And she came up during a time where all Black towns were very popular. Okay? All Black towns were very popular. Um, these all Black towns came up shortly after the Civil War. Okay? Shortly after the Civil War. Um, as African Americans were finally so-called freed from slavery, many of them uh, didn't have the money or the means to go all the way up north. And some of them didn't wanna leave their families. They had family members in the South that they felt connected to and they didn't wanna leave. So many of them stayed in the South, but they did not necessarily wanna stay near um, the white folks that they had just got done working for. So many black people started to form their own towns, almost to say they formed their own cities. And those few black people that were well off, they started to purchase land after the war. That's actually how uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma came to be. Tulsa, Oklahoma was built by a wealthy, two wealthy black men. Um, and literally they just kind of invited people to this city to live. Same way with Sweet Auburn Avenue in Atlanta and other cities as well. So wealthy black people <clears throat> and veterans of the Civil War started to purchase land and these land and this land would eventually be these kind of black village spaces, right? For black folks. Um, some white people actually would capitalize on some of the white violence by buying up the land and then encouraging black people to move there and convincing them that they were safe from racism. So this was kind of a way for some white capitalists to profit off of the racial tension in the South. And so it was also around this time, particularly that Zora Neale Hurston was alive, that there was this back to Africa movement happening. This was happening up north, this was happening in Harlem. And uh, this movement was led by a man by the name of Marcus Garvey. And this Back to Africa movement led by Marcus Garvey was a black nationalist, culturally nationalist movement that basically said that our time here in America is up and that in order for black people to achieve real liberation, achieve real freedom, they're going to have to move back to Africa because Africa is the ancestral homeland and the spiritual homeland for the Negro, for the color man, for black people at that time. And so Marcus Garvey convinced a lot of black people to invest in this project and this movement to get black folks from across the diaspora from America, North America, South America, the Caribbean, England, Great Britain, all over 
and convince them to move back to Africa. Not only convince them, but buy boats, buy boat lines to get them from these shores back to Africa. So this was the Back to Africa movement. And so the idea of Black people and some white people buying up these spaces in Oklahoma and Florida and Texas and Georgia and South Carolina, for those who didn't necessarily want to go back to Africa, because they said, first of all, that's a long way. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to get there. There are no planes during this time, or at least no planes that regular people could get on. Um, and number two, I don't know anything about Africa. I don't know how to speak the language that they speak. I don't know the culture. I know America. And as unfair as it is, this is my home. So some people, some Black people felt that way. And so these Black village spaces that were created gave Black folks the mentality that these spaces would be the next move in helping them to ensure freedom. So they said, listen, if we can't get along with white people or if white people can't get along with us, that's fine. We will then create our own cities and we'll just have these independent towns. And that's what they did. They went to work. They worked, they got paid less money, then they took that money and then they began to invest it back into these all black towns. Um, and to some degree, this was true of helping them to get on a path towards freedom because residents in these towns had a certain sense of autonomy and they were relatively free from white surveillance because white people lived on the other side of town. So they didn't have white people looking at them. They didn't have white people accusing them of things. They didn't have white people essentially physically in their space. And so this was a great step towards a pathway to freedom, a pathway to independence for black people. So then the question remains, well, what happened to these towns? What happened to these, to these areas, these spaces? One of the things was the wars, World War I, World War II. Um, different people fighting in these wars, destabilized these, these communities. taking people away from, particularly those people who went off to war, taking them away from these communities where they made money, where they were organizers and leaders. This was a problem. Also, you had terrorism by nearby white residents. It was a big problem. If you've ever seen the movie Rosewood, or if you know the story of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, these were big cities where African-Americans thrived. They had jobs, they had businesses. And in Tulsa, Tulsa was called Black Wall Street because they were so rich. They had their own businesses, their own shops, their own stores, their own insurance companies. They even had their own airlines. They were actually doing business and trading with Black people in Africa. They had their own boat lines. Black Wall Street, these people here were extremely rich. Why? Because the money that they received from working for white people, they took that money and they invested it back into their own community. So the dollar circulated multiple times. And so you had white people on the other side of town, they're seeing this they're seeing the way that African-Americans are living and they're not happy. Many of them did get jealous because they felt it was not fair for people who were supposed to be naturally and biologically inferior to them, having things, cars, airlines, schools, 
that were nicer and better than their material resources. But they didn't go and attack Black Wall Street for that reason alone. Another, the main reason, or the scapegoat, was that a it was uh, a, a myth or a fictional story that a white woman was sexually assaulted on a on, on an elevator in one of the black owned hotels. And when it got back to the white people across town that a white woman was sexually assaulted, they went ballistic and they rushed that town and burnt it all down. Now there's been nothing to confirm that that story was true, but unfortunately the idea of that story caused an entire city, an entire area of a city to be burned to the ground. And this again, wasn't just in uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa. This happened in Rosewood. This happened in Jasper, Texas. This happened in um, Wilmington, North Carolina. It's happened in places and spaces all over the country where all black towns were destroyed because of jealousy, because of racism, under the guise of protecting women. But then also the Great Depression. The Great Depression also destabilized a lot of these communities because the Great Depression made it difficult for people to find jobs, to get food, all of these were um, made it difficult. It made it difficult for these towns to maintain themselves, especially when during the Great Depression, when many people fell on hard times. And then after that, that was the 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 first era of how a lot of these towns got decimated. And then in subsequent decades you had effects like desegregation. See, what kept these towns intact was that, and what made them necessary was, was that Black people could not go to other sides of the town to live, to socialize. So they had, or, so they had to create their own. Once they got the opportunity to go to the other side of town, the white side of town, Many of them took their economic resources and began to purchase land in the white side of town after desegregation to send their school, their kids to schools on the white side of town to shop in the white stores because now they can. So desegregation took a lot of the financial resources from these towns and they began to decrease. Declining populations, a lot of people were leaving. Not just leaving those towns, but leaving the South in general, going North for better job opportunities or going to bigger cities in the South, going to your Houston's, Nashville's, Atlanta's, Charlotte. So now a lot of these towns are shrinking because the population is shrinking. Then living in a post-industrial America, it's not about industry no more in terms of the hard steel industries of Ford, plastic, Chevy. And so these, now that a lot of these jobs are getting shipped overseas, and now more people are getting educated in the service industry, being psychologists, sociologists, social workers, doctors, lawyers, instead of making goods, is now about providing services. And now we're in a whole new occupational framework, where now it's about tech. Can you come up with an app? 
Can you advance technology forward? So all of these things helped to do away with the remaining towns that were left, all black towns that were left, post-civil rights, desegregation, and the light had a negative effect on these all black towns. So going back to the north, uh, to Zora Neale Hurston, um, <clears throat> Zora Neale Hurston is one of the premier researchers and scholars uh, that one studies when looking at the Great Migration and especially her studies on movement. And movement is an important part of place. We talked about this in the first part of the semester, like maybe the very first lecture, if I'm not mistaken, where we talked about how movement and migration makes place, right? And places develop based on who lives there and why and what they bring to those spaces to make it a certain type of place, right? So, Zora Neale Hurston, um, with her research, and she studied people in the North, she's, um, her, her specialty were Southerners. So a lot of her research, particularly one, um, oh, what was the last one? Bar Barrick, Barrick Man or something, but she, she interviewed the last Black person to be brought from Africa on the, on the Middle Passage. Phenomenal book. Starts with a B though, I can't remember. But um, I read it and it was it was incredible. Um, that uh, was a book uh, that took place in the South. Um, Their Eyes Are Watching God, I believe took place in the South. A couple other books that she's had, a lot of her settings are in the South. So Zora Neale Hurston uh, was a person who came from more of a middle-class family. Um, came from an area of town, uh, Eatonville, where it was one of these all black towns, right? And the people that lived there, the black folks that lived there were well-to-do. A lot of them were well-to-do. And so she came from that kind of family. So for her, it was not uncommon to see black people doing well, being mayors you know, of their small city, uh, being city council leaders, being teachers, being preachers, uh, being in these positions of power in these smaller cities. So this was something that she uh, uh, grew up seeing and she had a certain pride in who she was because this was common for her. Um, eventually she would go off to college. She would eventually go into anthropology and then she would get involved in what was known as the Harlem Renaissance, which was this big, cultural movement going on in the 1920s in Harlem where you get famous um, famous uh, poets such as Langston Hughes, famous singers such as Josephine Baker, famous thinkers such as W.E.B. Du Bois, all coming out of this movement in, in Harlem called the Harlem Renaissance. And so to give some sense to this movement, that Zora Neale Hurston, this migration that Zora Neale Hurston is experiencing, um, we can go to the text uh, on page, let's see, go to page 17. Um, and let's look at the first four paragraphs. So it starts off with completing her long journey. And I'll read it. And you can read it with me. Completing her long journey from Florida to New York, Hurston realized that most Black people did not live life in Eatonville, in an Eatonville. In Eatonville, Hurston grew up on a big piece of, of ground with two big chinaberry trees, shading the front gate and cape jasmine bushes with hundreds of blooms on either side of the walks. Harlem, with its densely populated close quarters, buzzed with possibility and, like Eatonville, was a predominantly Black place. Hurston was struck by the differences and similarities between Harlem and Eatonville. When I got to New York, she reflected and found that the people called them gardenias and that the flowers cost a dollar each, I was impressed. The home folks laughed when I went back down there and told them. So 
Zora Neale Hurston had an opportunity that most Black people didn't have at that time. She had the opportunity to live both in the North and in the South and to see the similarities and the differences, right? So to her, similarity, well, Harlem is a predominantly Black place where you see a Black people from all walks of life, from poor and working class all the way up to the upper class and rich, and they're successful and it makes you feel good to be a part of that racial group and that culture. But she saw that same thing in Eatonville in Florida. So that wasn't anything that was new to her. The difference was, I guess, the level of capitalism <laughs> that was there. The fact that there were flowers that literally grew alongside her porch that um, you could just pick if you want to in the South, in the North, they're selling them for a dollar. So you thought that was quite interesting, right? Something that was free and came out of the ground is something that people actually paid for. And then in addition to the compact space of being up North, being in New York, um, where in obviously in, in, in Florida, things were more spread out. There was much more space for people to run and play and experience life. Um, her academic privilege, the fact that she had a master's degree, uh, allowed her to do anthropological research on Black people across the North and South. And like they said in the link, she was um, sponsored. And a lot of these, these uh, early artists were sponsored by white philanthropists. So white people that had a lot of money and they were interested in these topics of the human experience and anthropology and sociology and art and Negro culture and music and jazz and literature. Um, they were interested in the arts and they just had, you know, they were just these white folks with all this money. They were like, hey, we're gonna pay you X amount of dollars to do this research and write this book. We're gonna pay you X amount of, do of dollars to create a book of poems about the Negro experience. You know, we're gonna pay, you know, we'll open up a club and allow for black jazz musicians to come in and, and create an ambiance of entertainment and culture and art for black and white patrons, right? So mostly for white patrons, because actually they, stuff like the Cotton Club were like for white people, but black musicians were the ones that were performing. So because of her privilege, because of her class privilege and her, her academic privilege, uh, Zora Neale Hurston was able to travel all across the country doing research, right? Doing research. And one of the things that Zora Neale Hurston was a lover of, and you can tell this in her texts and her books, she loved accents. She was a lover of accents. She was a lover of voices. She felt that voices and accents gave culture. It helped to understand, and you understand a culture by understanding language, right? And she used this to help people understand the Black map of the United States, the Black map, the Black geographies and places and spaces that made up the diversity in the United States. So for her, it wasn't just about studying Black people or studying the Negro at that time. It wasn't just about that. Right. It was also about understanding the variance within Black life. Black life in the South is different from Black life in the North. Black life in a more integrated South, where Black people and white people are living closer together, is different from Black life in an integrated North. Black life in a separate South, where you have Eatonville, a city that is kind of left alone and Black people can kind of do what they want is different from that kind of city in the, uh, uh, in the North, right? So there are these different things. And then the way people talk, it's very different. She also noticed that being from Florida, hearing people with Southern accents, it was very different from living in, uh, living in Harlem and hearing the more Northern accents. And so language and voices tell a lot about people. And if you read her book, her books, you can tell that she strongly embraces what's called AAVE, African American Vernacular English. And this is something that anthropologists use in their research. I use it in my research, sociology, 
um, where instead of writing what people mean in the Queen's English, in the proper English, you write it in a way where a person that hears it can hear it in that language. So for example, when I was, trans well, I'm doing similar research now, but transcribing work, transcribing interviews that I, that I have with people, obviously most people don't say, I want to go to the store and I would like to retrieve some food so that I can take it back to my family for the sake of eating and nourishment, right? So I wanted to go to the store, or I want to go to the store, grab some food, um, and then probably take it back home, and then me and my kids will sit down and eat and chill and talk about the day. And so instead of saying want to, I might write wanna. I want to go to the store. And instead of writing store, I may write stove. Right? I won't take out the, um, what you call it, the slang. So if the person said chill, then I would say, I would write down in the book or in the dissertation or whatever, chill. Because that is a part of the study. The people, the language, the culture, that means something. There is meaning in language. There is meaning. There is meaning in the in the in the code. And Zora Neale Hurston did that ten times, a hundred times over. She would write a whole book. Her last book that she wrote, where she interviewed the man, the last black person who was brought to the United States on the Middle Passage, and obviously he had a very strong, <laughs> very very strong. He was not formally educated, very strong Southern accent, very old man. And she wrote it exactly how he said it. So it almost looks like the whole book is in another language. Like you really have to sit and read the text and read the same line over and over and put yourself in his position and say, oh, that's what he said. And they still sometimes have a glossary as well, so you can kind of understand, but she did not change that. And white publishers oftentimes asked her to do this. They would say, can you transcribe this or can you, you know, uh, transpose it or, or, you know, put it in a language we can understand? And she said, no, if you're going to publish this book, you have to publish it with this language. And the reader is going to have to listen and figure out what the person is saying, because I'm not going to take away the power and the culture that is encoded in that language. And that's what made Zora Neale Hurston's work so beautiful. And that's what made her appreciation for culture so amazing. Um, so again, she wanted to maintain the authentic voice of the people that she wrote about in her text, and this was big during, during this time, and it's probably why she didn't make a whole lot of money. She wasn't as rich or as well known as she was later after she passed away, and that could have been the reason. But now that, you know, after the 60s and 70s and 80s, when more people started learning about her work through people like the famous rock star Janis Joplin, um, who was a big fan of Zora Neale Hurston, Oprah Winfrey, big fan of Zora Neale Hurston, the writer of The Color Purple. Um, I, uh, what's her name? Why can I remember her name? But big fan of Zora Neale Hurston, right? Alice Walker. Um, this is when you start to see a resurgence of her work and appreciation for her work. So language, voices, accents was big. Um, I want you to, just to kind of reiterate this thought, I want you to click on this link and check out this uh, clip on accents. It's, it's actually kind of funny. <clears throat> so it's kind of interesting, right? You see the examples of maps, or, I'm sorry, the examples of accents and things like that. And almost kind of makes you wonder about your own. I know for me, um, this was, yeah, when I was living in Jacksonville at the time, 
I didn't know I had an, an accent or a Southern accent until I left and went off to college. And even though I went to a college in the South, I went to a college where there were people from all over the world that, that went there. Um, so like my, my, my roommate was from Denver. Um, and then other people, he had another, he had two other friends from Denver who also lived there, who used to always be in our room. Um, then another friend we met, he was from Brooklyn, New York. Another friend, he was from New Orleans. Another one was from Kansas City. Um, I forgot what the other guy was from, but they all, we all kind of lived in the same suite, lived in all, they all came from various parts of the country. And it would always be interesting when we would talk because yeah, we had different accents and they would listen to me and say, oh my goodness, you sound country or you sound Southern. Um, and I, I didn't think I, I did. Um, so yeah, you know, and, but but it, it often tells a story and I, I would enjoy, that was one of my favorite parts of college was meeting people, especially going to a college where people came from just all over um, to go there. Cause I met friends and, you know, I, I met, I had colleagues and, and people that I was cool with from, from all parts of the United States. And so listening to accents and listening to culture and listening to those stories was always exciting for me. Um, that was my, my favorite one of my favorite parts about about college um so going to the next slide this is your assignment this is your web assignment um what do you what you're going to do is you're going to look at maps 4 through 14 on pages 20 through 33 and you're going to see i don't know how, how many maps from 20 to 33 maybe about 10 maps i guess and in a one to two page paper, I want you to give me a written narrative of what you're seeing in these maps. Okay, you're gonna see maps and you're gonna see percentages. And as you look through these maps, you're gonna see the percentages change. It says the US census black population percentage by region. And it's gonna change. 1900 is map four. 1910 is map five, map six, 1920, map seven, 1930. And it's gonna keep going and keep going all the way till you get to 2010, okay? And you're gonna notice a difference in the percentage of the black population. And I want you to tell me what's happening with this percentage based on what you're seeing. Where are people moving based on the increasing and decreasing of certain numbers? And I want you to pay attention to the decades. Each map is a different decade. Why are certain regions increased numbers increasing in certain decades and then they start decreasing in other decades? I want you to pay attention to that. And I want you to use what we talk about in this lecture as well as what we talked about in the past. I hope you've been paying attention in class. Use what you know about what was happening historically in these decades to explain why this population shift was so dramatic. So what was happening in 1900 and in 1910 and in 1920 and in 1930 for, for the population to be one way? And then what was happening in 1940 and in 1950 and in 1960 for it to be this other way and all the way. Okay. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, double space times the Roman 12 font, everything you know. Uh, the deadline is November 1st, 3 p.m. So I don't know when you're watching this, when you're looking at your PowerPoint, but um, that gives you quite a bit of time from when I upload this to when it's to do. So make sure you pay attention. All right. So next, um, every ghetto, every city. The authors talk about in Chocolate City's dust tracks on the chocolate map, 
The authors explain a song by Lauren Hill called Every Ghetto, Every City. And they look at this song as a song about Black geography and Black movement. Okay. Uh, if you want to listen to the song, you can, you can click that link. Um, it's an interesting song. I remember when it came out, I was like in middle school, maybe early high school, when the song came out in the late 90s. And it was a very popular song. Lauryn Hill was a very popular artist during that time. And um, if you listen to the song, you can see examples of Black movement. And you can see examples of Black spaces and places that she's describing that mean something to her. Not just because of the cultural relevance, but actually where it is in the city. And what it meant to grow up I think she grew up in New Jersey. So what it meant to grow up in New Jersey and experience all the things that she did in this place, this place that society calls the ghetto. But to her, it was something special. And it was, and, and so you have this new way of place meaning, place making and place meaning. This idea of a ghetto to her, she's saying, People are saying that this is a ghetto because most of us are working class or poor. Um, there's a lot of us living here. The housing isn't as nice as it is in other parts of town. Um, and pretty much everybody here is black or Latinx, right? So this is seen as a ghetto, that has one meaning. But to the people who live here, it's different. And she relates it, if you know anything about Lauryn Hill, she's very spiritual, right? She, she quotes the Bible and, and, and she'll quote the Quran and she'll quote um, teachings from um, his Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie. And um, so she, she reads a lot of books on Rastafarianism. And so she, she has these, very spiritual ways of looking at the world. And she relates city life, ghetto life, to what she calls the New Jerusalem, right? That's why the, the, the hook says, every ghetto, every city and suburban place I've been makes me recall my days in the New Jerusalem, right? She looks at it as a spiritual happening. But the reason why this example is so spiritual to her is because not necessarily the space in which she's in, which is how the outside world looks at it, ghetto, poor, black, but how these people here make it a place that is spiritual and that is beautiful, that is cultural and uplifting, right? So let's go to page 24. And I'm gonna read the first two full paragraphs. And it says, <clears throat> In every ghetto, every city, we learn from Hill that Black geography is linked across time and across space and time. Whereas Brooks Center of Gravity is Chicago's South Side, Northern New Jersey is an urban Black landscape on which Hill's map is built. It is a Black geography motivated by a childhood and daily life that required her to move within and across a Black region. We are presented with a Black map of North Jersey, Essex County, the state's third most populous reflecting a county within a county. This black county within Essex County, dubbed the New Jerusalem, has its own geography based on an existing black residential sa savoir faire. The knowledge of black areas that are the context where, uh, where black residents watch fireworks on July 4th, fight and experience police brutality and gang crimes, and attend funerals and, birth and birthday and block parties. This black belt through and around Essex County borders is defined by the Ivy Hill neighborhood of Newark to the working class black city of Irvington to the black Hooterville, Hill's childhood. Um, neighborhood adjacent to South Orange, a predominantly white suburb of Newark to the long blocks of Central Avenue, a major throughway in East Orange, a predominantly black suburb of Newark. In the song, Hill gives us the sounds and rhythms of a recurrent and important urban Black coming of age story. One where Black residents traverse many Black neighborhoods across a series of cities 
as a part of their daily lives. It is a black geography based on a cultural and visual map springing from the lives and neighborhoods of black residents. And so if you, so if you look at the verses to this song, let's look at this one that I, I've just took a couple of lines from the song and tell me how you see movement and the black geography in, in these verses, right? So I'll give you some time to read this for yourself. Look at how, figure out where you see movement where you see culture, where you see migration happening in this, and then we'll talk about it together. So this says, every ghetto, every city and suburban place I've been makes me recall my days in the New Jerusalem. Story starts at Hooterville. Grew up next to Ivy Hill when kids were stealing quarterbills for fun. Killed a guy in Carter Park was a game that kids play. And then it goes on. A bag of bontons, 20 cents and a nickel. Springfield Ave had the best popsicles. Saturday morning cartoons and kung fu. Main Street, Main Street roots tonic with the dreads. A beef patty and some cocoa bread. Move the patch from my leaves to the tongue of my shoe. Member Freeing Hoisin used to have the bomb le leather back when Doug Fresh and Slick Rick were together. Looking at the crew, we thought we'd all live forever, right? So where do you see movement? Where do you see black geography in this, um, in these verses? Um, you see kids, Right here, she talks about a story that starts in this place called Hooterville. And then they move from Hooterville to this place called Carter Park where they're playing. You can almost see and visualize a whole day where these, where these kids start off at home in Hooterville and they go to all these various places. They go and play in Carter Park. Now they're hungry. So they say a bag of Bonton, 20 cents and a nickel. Springfield Ave had the best popsicle. So you can almost imagine the kids saying, I'm tired of playing and I'm hungry. Let's go to Springfield Ave and get some bontons and some popsicles. So then they go to Springfield Ave. Saturday morning cartoons and Kung Fu. Maybe they decide now to go back home, watch cartoons, watch their favorite Kung Fu movie, right? And then later on, or maybe while they're at home, they have what's called a beef patty and cocoa bread, which if you're familiar with Jamaican cult, culture or Caribbean culture, beef patty and cocoa bread is a very popular Jamaican dish. Um, this place, I think it's called Free, Freeland, Freeland Housing, used to have the bomb leather. So obviously this is a place that has very nice clothing. Leather, you know, often you probably wouldn't wear leather in the summertime in the south <laughs> but this is in new jersey and so leather is a big deal in up north in the city because it keeps you warm right so again talking about the things here that remind you of place and of space and then then she says something that leads to this larger culture back when doug fresh and slick rick were together doug fresh if you know anything about the early days of hip-hop Doug Fresh was a was a bebop. Um, he made beats with his mouth, and Slick Rick was a rapper, and they were very popular. And they went around to different areas and they performed and sold records and traveled the world performing. Right. Eventually, they will break up, like a lot of groups do. So, looking at the crew, we thought we all live forever. She's telling a story of culture of movement telling a culture of Black geography, not just in her city, but this larger culture of hip hop, right? And this provides meaning to where she lives. But then if you go back to the title, every ghetto, every city, and even if you go back to the hook, every ghetto, every city and suburban place I've been, makes me recall my days in the New Jerusalem. She's saying, this isn't the only place that's like this. Look at your city. 
Look at where you live. Look at where you grew up. How do you see culture? How do you see movement? How do you see place making and place meaning in where you live and where you grew up? And you can tell a story that's very similar to the story she's telling because she's saying, I'm not the only one. And New Jersey isn't the only place that has this culture of movement and migration and life and place making. So it's quite, it's quite a fascinating, this is just a couple of lines from the, from the, the, the song, it's quite fascinating. Um, and this is what the authors, um, um, Zandria Robinson and um, Marcus Hunter bring to us through this text, Chocolate Cities. And so I want you to think of a similar song, maybe from your generation. This is from 98, so <laughs> to a lot of people that's, you know, a long time ago. So can you think of a similar song from your generation? Or maybe your playlist? Maybe you're not familiar with Lauryn Hill, but you have a playlist. And a song that explains the importance of movement and how it may relate to geography. Geography and space and culture. And how do you see some similarities between your song and the stories and warmth of other sons, because that's what the warmth of other sons is. That reading is just strictly stories about migration, stories about movement, stories about movement out of survival, out of movement as a strategy for life, movement as a strategy for difference and mobility. And so how do you see your song on your playlist on Spotify or Tidal or Apple Music or wherever you listen to music. How does it relate? How does that song about movement relate to what you read in the warmth of other songs or relate to what you saw, what you read in the chocolate map? Chocolate Cities. I'll share with you a song that I like that I think is, is interesting and I, I think it definitely speaks to, to movement. Hold on for a second. All right, so let me see. I can share my screen with you. So this is a song by Nipsey Hussle. And it's called Dreaming. Um, and I really like this song. It's on one of my playlists. And it has some, it may have some words in there. So if you have a sensitive eyes or sensitive ears, you can close them. Um, but he says, yeah, look, now I was driving down Wilshire, just left the label, lit my Swisher suite. Then we made a left on Rodeo, which, which are streets in South Central Los Angeles. This is where Nipsey Hussle is from, Los Angeles. He said, life is beautiful, if I might say so. I live it unrestricted. There ain't a place that I can't go. So he's giving you a story of freedom. When he's in his city, when he's in his area, he feels free. He feels like life is beautiful because there is no restrictions on where he's able to move. Even though he's black, even though he's in the inner city, even though he writes move, uh, songs about how rough it can be living in the inner city, he still feels a certain level of freedom that often does not exist for many people who live where he's grown up. He says, Gayo, Gayu, Kaku, hot shots and cold fish, which I guess is a place where. They sell hot shots and cold fish, pints of duche and coconut Ciroc fits. So if you're a, a drinker, um, those are this type type of alcohol. Um, living drama, living drama free Roosevelt Cabana suites. TMZ questions me about my strands of weed. I like to vacation on Miami Beach. Um, so now he's talking about this, this, this movement now from where he is to being able to vacation right? Being able to have the money, the means, the resources to go on vacation in Miami. A couple homies from the set, some Atlanta freaks. 
used to have them pounds cheap in 2003, most of the blank from back then in penitentiaries. So here he's telling a story, not just about movement geographically, but about movement in terms of social mobility, right? So he's talking about um, um, having this experience at one point in his life in 2003, when he did not have as much money, when he lived in the quote unquote hood or quote unquote ghetto, right? And he had to hustle and he had to make a way for himself. And him and his friends all were kind of doing the same thing. Him, he was lucky enough to be able to find music and be successful in music so that he no longer has to live in those areas. He no longer has to do the things he used, he felt he had to do in the past to be successful. Unfortunately, many of his friends were not as lucky, were not as fortunate. So he's saying a lot of my friends back then are now in penitentiaries. So he's not just talking about geographical movement, but he's talking about social, social mobility, social movement and elevation. And now they see me on their TV, like how could it be? So now those same friends are now looking at him on television while they may be locked up in prison or in the penitentiary and saying, wow, he made it, right? So this movement of where we were to where he is, there's this social kind of elevation happening. It's complicated how I made it like Avril Lavigne. How did he get here? How did he get to this point from being where he was hustling, where he was in the streets to now being very successful, owning businesses, vacationing in Miami, um, and living a life that is very unrestricted, coming from a, a, a situation where he was very restricted, right? Restricted in education, restricted in opportunities, restricted in housing. And he's saying, I can't even believe I made it here. But it's, and, and even if I were able to describe it to you, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. It's intersectional. It's race, it's class, it's gender, it's culture, it's education, it's enlightenment, it's privilege, it's so many different factors that come into social mobility. And then a lot of times it's just luck. Because he'll tell you, I didn't really do anything much different than they, than they did, but the opportunity came and I was able to capitalize on it. He said, and that's why they rooted for me because I'm speaking what they think. So he says, even though some of my friends are in penitentiaries, they know that I still am connected to them. So even though I was able to be mobile and move into an area of life that they were not able to do, they know that that movement has not disconnected us. We're still connected ideologically. We're still connected culturally. And so what they think but can't say because they're behind bars because now they're restricted in their movement for however long, I can take what they think and I can put it in my rap music and I can share it with the world. So we're still connected. Without no pieces, I could show you how to build a dream hustle. So he's saying, I came from an area, I came from a situation where I had no pieces, I had no bricks, I had no um, concrete, I had nothing and I took nothing and took that to build a dream, to build the life that I have now. So again, he starts off talking about physical geographical movement, and then he goes deeper into a social kind of uh, movement, an economic movement, a movement of a mentality, and still talks about the connection that he has with the people that, um, that he was with at that time. So I, I really think this is a, this is a very interesting um, piece on movement uh, that I always like to share. So feel free to do your own um, and share it with me. All right, so we're gonna finish this up by talking about reverse migration. So we talked about great migration, we talked about Black people in the early 20th century leaving the, leaving the South, going up North um, for opportunities. Now, as Black people begin to make their way back to the South shortly after the Civil Rights Movement, so we talked about this in the past as well, um, <clears throat> while many African-Americans did move up North, 
there were generations who didn't want to leave the South, who felt that it wasn't, the answer was not to leave the South, the answer was to change the South. And so you had folks like Rosa Parks and Dr. King and Dr. King's father and many others who said, no, I'm not going to leave. Even though, well, Dr. King left, but he came back, went to school in Boston. And he came back and said, no, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay and I'm going to challenge government, state, local government, federal government to make the South a better place, not to leave and go up North thinking that that's a better place. And so after that happened and after the policies and the, and the victories of the civil rights movement, you start to see what's called a reverse migration. You start to see black folks saying, oh, the South is better now. It's not like how it was a couple of decades ago. Wow, there's opportunities in the South. Wow, these, there's colleges, there's black colleges in the South that black people can go to and learn, and get educated and be successful. Wow, they're opening businesses in the South. Wait, these big businesses that were up North, now they have corporations in the South. So now they're starting to see expansion and growth. They're starting to see that, same way that Nipsey Hussle said, the South is becoming more unrestricted for Black folks. In a place I can't go. Now, if you were to live in Mississippi, you could live in Mississippi as a Black person and have some level of freedom, at least more than you would have had prior to the Civil Rights Movement. Right? Same place, Georgia, Florida, other places in the deep South that prior to the civil rights movement was not a place that many black people wanted to live. And so what you start to see is this leaving of the urban landscape. Now people are starting to leave New York and leave Chicago and leave New Jersey and leave Philadelphia. And why are they leaving? A couple reasons. And this is what we call push-pull factors. Push-pull factors is a part or a, an example of um, the consequences that people use to leave or come to a certain place. So some of the push-pull factors that existed for why people left the North and so were pushed out of the North and pull to the South. One was the prison industrial com complex. So up North, there was this much bigger, much more harsh policing that was going on in California. We talked about that uh, in LA and in Compton, as well as in, in New York and Chicago. This policing, more and more black men were going to prison. And so that was pushing people out of the North, the jobs that were being created in the South were pushing, were pulling people towards the South. The decline in jobs up North was pushing people out of the North and the growth in jobs in the South were pulling people to the South. The deindustrialization, we talked about that, where a lot of these industries in the North were now going overseas was pushing people out of the North and cultural relevance where a lot of these people whose grandparents and great grandparents had houses and land and families in the South, this was pulling them back down South. Opportunities that were up North were no longer there. Residence was becoming more and more expensive as New York and Philly and Chicago and these places were becoming more and more expensive to live, Pittsburgh, DC, Buffalo, becoming way more expensive. Housing opportunities were much better down South. The same house, it, it, it may cost almost a million dollars to live in. You move down South, it's four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars say, I want to go down there. I can live in a five, six bedroom house for $400,000. And up north, I get an apartment with three bedrooms for almost a million. 
So the push-pull factor, housing is more expensive, housing is more cheaper, it's pushing and it's pulling. So this is what we call in demography, this is what we call in sociology and migration studies, push-pull factors. Um, the study of black neighborhoods and communities in particular has shown that there is a detrimental impact of these flawed federal policies and large scale economic shifts and segregation that has led to this change in migration patterns. And if we look at migration patterns, we see the story of not just black folks in America, but you see the story of America. You see the story of the United States. Let's look at this last section, page 34. And it says the influential link between black mobility and migration remains. We know for instance, that black residents, especially those who are poor, tend to move frequently, leaving their neighborhood for other neighborhoods with better resources. Add to this that research continues to indicate that white migration, notably white flight, is shaped by black migration. And we come closer to a fuller picture of how race, place, and politics shape the US map. As Black Americans migrate, other demographic groups take cues from that movement and adjust their neighborhoods, migrations, immigrations, and broader residential patterns accordingly. So as, according to Zandria Robinson, sociology professor at Georgetown, Marcus Hunter, sociology and African-American studies professor at UCLA, as Black people begin to migrate, and move, white folks respond to that. Latinx people respond to that. Asian Americans respond. Different groups respond to that movement and they then move based on that and vice versa. So looking at movement, looking at migration, looking at place, place making and place meaning, these things tell a larger story about what is happening culturally in the country that we're living in. And this is what makes this uh, section, this is what makes these readings so very important, okay? All right, cool. Um, that is that. Next week, uh, I think we only talk about one thing because I want to say I give you some time to do your paper, um, yeah. So we're just talking about ghost mapping, spatializing blackness. Um, also, I'm gonna try to get your, some of those um, student lecture videos done. So I'll try to get some of those done during that time as well. So with that being said, um, enjoy your week, enjoy your weekend. And um, I look forward to talking with you all soon uh, if you have any questions reach out to me inbox email or come into the office hours all right everybody have a good weekend a good weekend